Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, so today what I'd like to do uh, is spend some time and talk with you a little bit about uh, cognitive training, some of the computerized programs that are available. Uh, I'm sure you have all heard of some of these programs. Um, and what I would like to do is talk to you a little bit about what some of the realities are, what some of the um, concerns that we have as the scientific community and how you might be able to utilize this information in making decisions about whether or not this is something you want to pursue. Um, so uh, to give a little bit of background, I did a lot of training uh, at, in Los Angeles at UCLA. And while I was there uh, is really where I developed an interest in these computerized platforms. I think integration of technology into what we do as clinicians uh, and thinking about ways that we can uh, utilize these resources to promote brain health is really outstanding. And I think that we should be able to take that technology and, and use it to the best of our advantage. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about where some of these programs have come from, um, but that's really where I started to take a, an interesting look at some of these platforms. Um, I'm not going to present any data today on any research that I've personally done, but I've spent a lot of time reviewing the literature and going through some of the, the scientific findings as well as some of the concerns that the scientific community has. Um, and we'll kind of start from that point and then work our way backwards. Uh, what I'm, I've tried to save a lot of time at the end of the talk for questions. I know that this group likes to ask questions and that's perfectly fine. Uh, and this is also a topic that really seems to generate a lot of interest in questions. So what we'll do is we'll kind of save some time at the end uh, and try and make sure we uh, ask those questions then. Um, so maybe if you think of something along the way, maybe take a quick note and write it down and that way it'll be fresh in your mind towards the end there. All right, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay. All right, so I'd like to begin, well, and I'm gonna also preface my talk in, by saying, and I don't mean this to sound like a naysayer or a doomsayer, but if you came here expecting me to tell you that this is going to be, that these pro cognitive training platforms are the cure for dementia and are gonna keep you from aging and really make you uh, a very smart thinker, I'm afraid you might leave here a little bit disappointed. But I hope by the end, though, you've come to realize that it's not all bad news. And we're going to go through exactly what I mean by that in a, in a minute. I want to start, though. Um, I'm sure you, you've all heard of Stanford University. Pretty well-respected place, usually pretty bright people that work there. Um, not necessarily as bright as people in our building, but they're pretty <laughs> smart. Um, earlier, well, actually, later last year, um, a group of scientists from Stanford as well as some neuroscience institutes, uh, about a hundred different scientists came together and put toge and released a public statement that really focused on the claims that some of these scientific platforms uh, and programs have made. And I'm going to read to you uh, a portion of the statement that they have released. This is the ultimate bottom line conclusion that they made. We object to the claim that brain games offer consumers a scientifically grounded avenue to reduce or reverse cognitive decline when there is no compelling scientific evidence to date that they do. It's a relatively damning statement right in and of itself. The promise of a magic bullet detracts from the best evidence to date, which is that cognitive health in old age reflects the long-term effects of healthy and engaged lifestyles. I'm going to go through and talk in a little bit uh, of detail about several of the points that they've made. Um, this is a relatively lengthy statement, and you know they really go into detail about their criticisms. Um, and I think a lot of the points that they make are valid, but I am also going to caution and say that I think that they missed a big, a, a big factor in, in, the, in the larger picture, which is what I'm going to talk about when we get to the end here. So just to give a little bit of a contextual framework here, what does normal aging do to cognition? How does it evolve throughout the lifespan just as a sample of, a, as, of normal functioning? Well, we know 
that changes in thinking, particularly memory, are a normal part of the aging process. It happens to everyone, and it's something, well, I'm going to actually put an asterisk by that everyone. I'll talk about that just real briefly. But most people experience a normal change in aging. Sometimes those changes happen sooner than we would anticipate or more quickly than we would anticipate. And those are the concerns that we have when people have, say, Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. In a normal aging process, though, this gives you a, a general overview of how things change. You'll notice that beginning in the 20s, there's a pretty steady decline in most aspects of cognition over time. Things like how quickly you think, the speed of processing, your ability to keep information in your mind as you're working with it, what we call working memory, um, your long-term memory and your short-term memory, all of these areas of cognitive functioning generally show a pretty steady decline beginning in, in your 20s, really, um, which is a, a tidbit that a lot of people find quite surprising. Um, the exce one exception to that is that in terms of world knowledge, your amount of factual information, learning tidbits, you know, things like history, your, your own personal experiences, things like that, um, this kind of information we actually show uh, remains relatively stable or even possibly increases over the lifespan. And that's sort of your factual information and your ability to kind of retain knowledge. Um, was anyone here at the Super Brains conference last week? And one of the topics of conversation that was brought up was the idea of super aging. And there is a small group of individuals, and this is an ongoing research study uh, based out of the uh, Northwestern University in Chicago that has found a very small group of people who actually show preserved or stable cognition well into older adulthood. And we're trying to learn more about these groups of individuals so we can better understand what's unique about them besides their cognition, so we can try and understand a little bit more about how we can translate some of that into the, the larger population. So how do older brains adapt uh, throughout the lifespan? You know, a lot of these changes, although we see these changes on testing, um, you may not necessarily experience it as obviously throughout your life. One of the things that in order to achieve the same level of memory, your experience that your memory hasn't changed in older adulthood is that your brain, when it's younger, it's really efficient and it doesn't take as much real estate to achieve the same functions. But as you get older, the efficiency slows down and there is this need to recruit other parts of the brain. So when you're younger, let's, if we think in terms of numbers, let's just use some generic numbers. If when you're a younger adult, uh, let's say it takes 10 units of brain power to achieve a task, maybe when you're a little older, now it takes 20 units or 30 units. And this idea of recruiting more brain activation in order to achieve the same uh, functions is something that's been relatively well studied and I have here the HERALD model which stands for hemispheric asymmetry reduction in older adults. Basically what that means is your brain is taking more effort to do the same amount of work or less amount in terms of functioning. Okay? So that's sort of the normal aging process. I'm going to change gears just a little bit and talk for a second about um, London taxi drivers. Anyone been to London except for Dr. Banks? <laughs> um, it's pretty complicated. Uh, I haven't been. I'm hoping to go at some point. But this is a, this is a map uh, of London. To me, it kind of looks a bit like spaghetti. Uh, I can imagine that it would be a pretty difficult place to find your way and, and navigate. Um, now, Something that I learned is that to be a taxi driver in London, if you've been here, I've got a picture of, the, uh, of the, the taxis. To become a taxi driver requires actually a sophisticated and a high level of knowledge. These individuals train for years in order to be able to achieve this status and maintain this occupation. Um, and one of the things that they have to do is they have to pass an examination. And the examination is basically, I would give you two addresses anywhere in London. And you would have to tell me the shortest and fastest route between those two points. That's the map. <laughs> so you can imagine how complicated that might be and how much knowledge you have to retain in order to be able to do that efficiently. 
Um, what this really shows, and, and Dr. Banks is going to talk in, in depth about this uh, next week in her talk. I'm not going to try and take away from that. But this has shown us that there's this significant amount. These individuals have a tremendous amount of expertise. And what this line graph here shows is that there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus. And that's the part of the brain that's associated with memory. And you can imagine that in order to be able to identify and know this like the back of your hand, you've got to have a pretty good memory. So some scientists thought at one point in time, well, gosh, I wonder if these individuals who have gone through this have developed a larger hippocampus. Maybe there's differences in some way that their brain is working compared to people who haven't gone through this process. And sure enough, they found that there are differences. What's really interesting, this line here is a, is a, a correlation. It shows an association between how big their hippocampus is and how long they've been a taxi driver. The main point I want you to take away from this is that the longer somebody was a taxi driver, the bigger their hippocampus was. Kind of an interesting idea. So you're, you might be thinking, well, why, why are we learning about taxi drivers? What does this have to do with brain training? Well, this was one of the earliest studies for that we were able to really show that your brain changes with experience. This idea of neuroplasticity, the ability for your brain to adapt and change in response to your behaviors, your activities, and the things that you do. Well, now that maybe you'll see the link that, well, if we can get taxi drivers, if there's this association there, maybe we can use that and develop some therapy. Maybe there's things that we can do to help you develop this same kind of activity that can change and induce synaptic or neuroplasticity in your mind. I'm not going to go so far as to say is that this is where the, uh, the whole concept of brain training started, but it's certainly one of the founding ideas that led to this proliferation. So there have been, um, there have been some studies done. I'm not going to say that there have been a lot, because again, this is a relatively new area uh, of scientific inquiry. Um, but one of the largest studies that's been done, I'm going to talk about now, which is this trial called the ACTIVE trial, uh, Advanced Cognitive Training for Independent and Vital Elderly. This is uh, a study that's a longitudinal study. It was originally done uh, in 2004. And to the best of my knowledge, this study represents the largest randomized clinical trial to date that has studied the effects of cognitive training. Now, um, wh why is that important? Why is, a, why is this such a significant study? Well, when we think about intervention trials, when we're looking at developing treatments, when we're trying to figure out if new medications work, the highest level of scientific evidence that we have is when we've been able to take a whole bunch of studies and look at them all together and see what is the pattern of performance that all of these studies as a whole group show? So if you've got 10 studies, well, let's take a look at all of those 10 studies and synthesize all that and package it into one piece. Well, the, the idea is that the, the kind of evidence that goes into those studies is really important. If you put a bad study into that kind of analysis, you're going to get bad information on the other side, right? A randomized controlled trial like this is the highest level of evidence that is, is a very high level of evidence because the way that it works is people, they take individuals, they're very heavily screened, they have made sure that these are healthy individuals who don't have any history of neurological illness, these are people that have been carefully selected to participate. What's interesting about this study, I want you to note that there are over almost 3,000 people who have participated in this study. That is a gigantic study. A lot of the studies that we do uh, in neuropsychology, for example, have maybe 100, 500 would be considered a pretty big study. This has almost 3,000. This is a humongous study. So what they do is they take all of these individuals then who are eligible to participate and they randomly assign them to a couple different groups. The groups that they used in this study, there was a group for memory training, there was a group for processing speed training. 
There was a group for reasoning training. And then there was this no contact control group, which is very important because we want to be able to have a group that doesn't get any exposure so we can see what the natural effects of aging are, right? Now, so once these individuals have been identified, they get randomly assigned to one of these four groups. As a, as a study participant, you would have no way of choosing which one you go to. You wouldn't be able to select. It would be completely done at random. And that's really important because it helps scientists avoid developing a bias by, you know, if they, you know, let's say, for example, they have a, they have a particular finding that they're trying to, to show, they might be able to farm more people and say, okay, well, this guy looks like he's going to get better. Let's put him in this group. By using a randomized design, they avoid that. So this is a really powerful research study. The individuals who went through this trial participated in 10 initial training sessions, and then at one year, they had an outcome evaluation. And then, I'm sorry, at one year they had a booster session, kind of a brush up to, to give them sort of a refresher. They had another refresher then three years later. Okay? And that was the end of the contact that they had with the intervention. It was then the responsibility of the, par the participants to continue to utilize those interventions over the course of the study. Um, what they did then is they then measured, there's been a couple follow-ups to this. Uh, one happened, uh, I believe, four years after this original study was done. And the most recent one is they've done a 10-year follow-up, which I'm going to come back to in just a second. But they measured then, after they've gone through this training process, they looked at reasoning ability, memory ability, processing speed. And those were some of the cognitive outcomes that they looked at. And then they looked at whether or not these individuals showed better problems in their everyday life, their day-to-day -day functioning, besides beyond just the tests that they took. Um, so they looked at everyday problem solving. They looked at their ability to maintain their activities of daily living. Were they, were they still independent? Was there any change in their independence after participating? Uh, and then they looked at just everyday speed of processing. These functional outcomes are very important. While one of the concerns that we might have, and I'm going to come back to this in, in, in a little while, but one of the concerns, if I train somebody on a reasoning task, if I, go, if I put you through a reasoning task and then I test your reasoning ability, chances are you might get better in reasoning. But how does, does that have any bearing whatsoever on your day-to-day -day life? We don't really know. And so that's why these values or these outcomes were also included as part of this study. Because we want to be able to show not only is there a change in reasoning ability, but is there also a subsequent change in your everyday life? Does it have a benefit beyond just the things that we're studying in the lab? Okay. Um, so what happened? This is a busy slide. And I, don't, I, I recognize that. But there's a few things that I want to point out here. So, this is data that were taken from the outcome study that was published um, just last year by one of the original study authors. And these are the data that they have uh, collected after the individuals uh, had originally gone through. So this is 10 years later. Okay? And there's a few things that I have here circled in red. And I'm going to point them out uh, as best I can here. But in this column, you've got the memory training group. In this column, you've got the reasoning training group. Here, you've got the processing speed training group. And then this last column, this is the control group. These are the people who didn't get any kind of intervention. And what I've circled here are a few numbers. These are the percentage or the amount of people in the original study who showed, that they, who showed no change in their cognitive functioning. These are all the percentage of people who stayed the same over that 10-year period. Now, in the memory training group, 36% of people, of the original people, stayed the same over 10 years. 36%. You might think, wow, that's not so bad. But what about the other 64% that got worse? Hmm. And then we look at the control group. Well, 31% or 69% or, or of the control group, they got worse. You're looking at 69% at versus 64%. Is that really, did that help? I'll, we'll come back to that in a second. In the, in the reasoning group, 73% of people in the reasoning group, they stayed the same. 
62% of people in the control group, they also stayed the same. So we actually see that maybe this is a bit of a difference. Maybe there is somewhat more people who stayed better. And then we look at the processing speed group, and this is really important. In the processing speed group, 71% of people stay, who went through this cognitive training stayed the same over a 10-year period, whereas only 48% of people who didn't get any kind of treatment, they only 48% stayed the same. That's a pretty big difference. So, more numbers. Another busy slide. But I, I put this here because I, there's, two, there's two things that I really want you to focus on. And one is that when we look at those numbers, the numbers that I took from that previous slide, we see when we looked at the memory training in that particular study, there was only a 5% reduction in the risk of, cognitive, of memory decline in a 10-year period for the people who went through this study. This is compared to if you went through the processing speed training, you had a 23% reduction in your risk of experiencing decline. We can take this one step further. And through some statistics and, and math, what we find is that in order for me to prevent one person from experiencing a decline in their memory using this intervention over a 10-year period, I would need to treat 21 people over a 10-year period. Only one in 21 is gonna, get, is gonna stay the same. Compare that to the, uh, the processing speed group, that looks a lot better. One in five are gonna get better over a 10-year period. Pretty big difference there. I mean, and so this is the kind of information that I look at when I'm evaluating some of the research that comes out from these trials. And I don't expect you to be able to go and take this information and say, oh, well, I, it looks like they're gonna ha I'm going to get this much better. Or I have this much of a risk. But as, as a scientist, these are the kinds of information. This is the evidence that I look for when I look at these studies that get published. Now, the, the the program that was evaluated by the group that I just talked about, that active trial, that wasn't a commercially available product. That's not the kind of thing um, that you could go and buy off the shelf or subscribe to on the internet. Um, it's a little, it's similar, the ideas are similar, but that was a program that was very well constructed and carefully crafted by experts and scientists in the field. What about the commercially available things? I have a few samples here uh, of just some of the things that are, are noted. Brain Age was one of the earliest. This was actually a Nintendo game for your Game Boy, a little handheld thing. Um, had things like Sudoku in it. There was some additional problem solving. Train your brain in minutes a day was, was their slogan. Um, one of the earliest to come out. There's been a whole host of other, them, uh, other platforms since then. Lumosity, I'm sure, is one that you're all very familiar with. They've got TV commercials. I'm sure that you've seen internet ads. Uh, it's one of the largest and most popular uh, that are out there. There's a few others, though. Brain HQ is one by Posit Science, um, which is very similar, slightly different, but uh, another, uh, another platform that operates much in the same way as Lumosity. Uh, Rosetta Stone, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard of as the company that does the language training. Um, the language training projects from what, pro products, from what I know, work very well. They're Rosetta Stone, they're FitBrains, eh, I'm not so sure. But it's another kind of platform that's designed as a cognitive training platform. Um, Elevate is another one, and um, I'm not going to lie, Elevate when you look at it aesthetically, the graphics of it, it's amazing. It looks fantastic. In fact, so much so that Elevate was named as Apple's app of the year in 2014. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. I don't know of any uh, publication that has looked at Elevate in particular, but it looks good on, when, you, when you're looking at it on the screen. So, why, why have all these products come about? What, what's the, why is there this interest? Money. Who said money? <laughs> the baby boomer population is rapidly entering older adulthood. Um, and one of the most interesting things to come from this is that there has been a prominent increase in cognitive health and, and aging. Um, 
with popular media and with science and, and the, I mean, we hear about things like dementia much more these days than we ever have in the past. It's become a public health concern. And in fact, so there's a, I have a, an asterisk here. A lot of the information that I've taken from this site is from a website called sharpbrains.com. Has anybody ever been to Sharp Brains? Sharp Brains is a, it's a, they do not have a cognitive training platform. They're not affiliated with any company. They're not selling anything to the consumer. Um, they're really a market research for, uh, plat, uh, group that is kind of keeping their finger on the pulse of this whole new business sector. They're learning what, well, what's going on? Well, how much money are we looking at? What, what's happening? So I've gotten a lot of this information from Sharp Brains. Um, and I've had a chance to talk with one of the founders of that organization, really nice guy, very sharp, um, no pun intended. And uh, I, I like him. I think he's a pretty neutral guy. I don't think that he, he's really not trying to sell anybody on anything. He did a survey once, and among adults over the age of 50, staying mentally sharp was one of the top two priorities. Okay. Um, physical health and mobility was one of the other was the other big one, but staying mentally sharp was right up there near the top of the list. Well, of course, the the the, the commercial market and the business sector has responded in spades. In 2005, the global budget for these cognitive training platforms was around 210 million dollars. It's a pretty sizable chunk of change, but when you're thinking about the whole world. Ah, that's kind of a drop in the bucket. In 2012, okay, a few years later, five-fold increase to a billion dollars. This is now a billion-dollar industry in 2012. By 2020, it's projected that this will be a $6 billion industry. I mean, this is massive amounts of money. It's so prevalent now that they even have... They're in, here in Las Vegas, they even have national conventions on what's called neurogaming, integration of neuroscience into computer technology for the purposes of games. It, what's interesting is that the video game market is one of the, inter, one of the groups driving a lot of this. Um, as somewhat of a bit of an aside here, um, one of the real interesting areas is the idea of being able to integrate brain functioning into playing video games. Not these kind, not brain games, like video games, like Mario Brothers. Being able to control the characters on the screen and have the characters interact with your, with your brain. Um, that's one of the areas where this technology is being developed and transferred back into clinical practice. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, any of these platforms in specific. I think the things that we're going to talk about moving forward can be applied to any of these programs. I will say I know of none that have demonstrated reliably any consistent benefit in terms of cognitive health, more so than any of the others. Okay? I think that when you boil it all down, these are all the same. Regardless of the platform, I think that these are the, these are the ones that there's no real difference between them. Okay? Now, I'm sure you've heard a lot of the claims, the things that these uh, product makers have said. Um, for example, I've taken, the, I, I've retracted the name of, the, or redacted the name of the product here, but product is backed by peer-reviewed controlled research done at leading universities around the world and has proven to lead, lead to significant real-life improvements in 80% of users. Wow, 80%? Oh, how, how'd you figure that out? So we called them and asked. What do you think they said? I, did you do any science with this? Was there a control group? Somebody who didn't go through these? Oh, no, we just asked people. Wait, what? You just asked people if they got better? So really, really what this says is 80% of people said they felt better. Well, in science, we know, pretty, uh, we know pretty well that there's a very strong placebo effect. And that placebo effect is just the belief that you get better just because you think you're getting better. So I, this is meaningless to me. 80 per, I don't know what that means. Um, these games are often advertised as designed by neuroscientists. That's mostly true, actually. Pretty much most of these products have a scientific advisory board. They may have uh, individuals with PhDs or MDs who are part of their advisory council or, or provide consultation. Um, 
This is generally true. Some of these products have a, a more robust uh, platform or scientific advisory council than others. Um, I will say that uh, it's not necessarily clear how much involvement these individuals may have. Sometimes they're listed purely in namesake. They may get compensated for, for placing their name and their association with the website. So uh, I, I say, you know, I think that there are some legitimate neuroscientists that really do have credentials and experience and knowledge to back their claims. But I think that there's a lot of individuals out there who might be just there in name only. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that um, a lot of these platforms, so anybody used Lumosity? So Lumosity has a, it, all, of the, all of these different programs have, there's little, they're, they're built like games. Um, there's little like 10, 15 minute exercise. I think 10 and 15 minutes is probably even long. They're probably more like two to three minutes, I think. They're very short um, and they're, 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 they're gamified. And what this means is they have taken these time-proven tests of cognitive functioning, things that I might use in my clinic, and they've turned it into a game. Okay? And, and they've made it enjoyable. They've made it something that is engaging with people that people like doing, and, then they, and, and people keep coming back to play them. Um, and that's what I mean by gamification. So I think that when they say that these products are grounded in science, I think there's truth in that. But to say that they're, they're uh, an extension of science or based upon science, is, it's starting to get a bit of a stretch there. It's sort of a loose association. Um, but I will say that a lot of these games that are developed are based on actual measures of cognition that we use in our laboratory. Um, and they've just made them a little bit more fun. I mean, if you've ever had a neuropsych eval, they're not very fun. I'm not going to lie. Um, uh, I already mentioned about the advisory board uh, and having, you know, these are consultants from the scientific community who may or may not provide their expertise to the product developers. Um, some of them are compensated, some of them are not. I'm sure you've seen commercials on television that uh, will reference and say, you know, so and so is a paid spokesperson. Well, right, why do they put that there? It's truth in advertising. You need to know that, okay, this person was paid to say that. I, that may or may not be true for some of the scientific consultants that are associated with some of these products. Um, the transparency isn't, isn't always there. Um, the other big thing to concern is that, you know, these, these, these websites, if you read through them, they make these really ridiculous claims, some of them, like case in point. Um, they talk about these uh, studies that they have, backed by science, peer-reviewed. Well, there's some truth to that, but when I think about science, remember I was talking about how, you know, when we, the, the highest level of scientific evidence is a randomized trial or aggregating data across a whole bunch of studies, looking at them all together, looking at a few thousand people. Well, here we're talking about sometimes I've seen things that they published studies on like three or four people. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's not really that convincing of, a, uh, of an evidence base for me. Um, the reality of the situation is the evidence in general is quite mixed. Um, there, are, there have been over 125 peer-reviewed scientific papers that have been published uh, looking at various forms of cognitive training. And this comes from a website, uh, cognitivetrainingdata.org. This is a group that was founded by this cognitivetraining.org is, is a website that was developed and founded by some neuroscientists in response to that Stanford statement that I read to you in the very beginning. This is a group of, uh, also of neuroscientists who strongly believe that there is benefit and scientific evidence to support cognitive training. Okay? I'm sure you've all seen in the news how you'll, one day there's a study that says such and such that coffee causes cancer. Another day you'll see there's a study that coffee prevents cancer. There's all these back and forth and it's like, well, what, what the heck does this all mean? That's where we have to look at all of these data all at once. We have to integrate scientifically and statistically all of those studies into one to really make sense of it all. Um, nobody's done that yet with these with these studies of, of cognitive training. You know, there's been 125 of these studies, but to be honest, some of them aren't very good. You remember the slide that I showed you with the whole bunch of numbers that looked at this percent stayed the same, this percent in the control group stayed the same? That's really good data. I know what those numbers tell me. 
but I don't have that same amount of data, that same quality of data from a lot of these studies, so I can't do anything with it. I can't integrate it to study and look systematically at the overall evidence base. Um, but I will say, I am gonna say though, there is some evidence to support the idea that cognitive training works. And in specific, that I think one of the problems and the concerns is that right now, if I say to you we're looking at training cognitive functioning, that's like a huge umbrella term. There's so many different facets of cognitive functioning. It's hard for us to pinpoint any one. And maybe what we're doing is we're kind of casting our net too wide. What we have shown is that there are certain areas of cognitive training that might actually be more amenable. Uh, working memory is one in particular that does seem to have some evidence to support that it works. There's a program available called CogMed, uh, which is published by one of the largest test makers in the world. This is not a program that is available to you at home. It's a program that you have to work with a licensed professional. It's not like Lumosity, you can't go to the website and sign up. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different platform, but they have a pretty good evidence base that it, it shows some benefit. Not a lot, but some, and that's important. When we look at the rest of these data, or the, these, these other publications, there's a few problems that really stand out. Remember when I was talking a few moments ago about that functional outcomes, how much like you might get better in the lab, but how, how much of an effect does this have in real world functioning? That's the generalizability problem, and that's a huge problem for almost all of these studies. Basically, here's the thing. If I give you a game, and you play that game over and over and over for weeks, you're gonna get pretty good at that game. But does that have any bearing on your real life functioning? You don't really know. And that's a big problem that a lot of these studies have. They don't have that same degree of functional outcome, the real world generalizability. Really, you just kinda of get good at these games. Um, the other problem is this file drawer problem. For a, just a bit of a context, when a scientific paper gets published, it has to go through a peer-reviewed process where, let's say if I publish a paper, I, I write a paper, it's gonna, I'm gonna submit it to a journal, and that journal, the editor is gonna send it out to some of my peers and say, read this. Does, this, does this guy know what he's talking about? And they'll give feedback and they'll say, oh yeah, this is good, you should publish it. And then they, that's how peer-reviewed science gets published. Um, the problem is, is that in order to get published, you have to have positive significant findings, okay? Well, so these 125 papers that have been published have shown, they've, they've shown some positive significant findings. They've shown that there's some change. What we don't know, how many studies have been done that have showed no change? What if I told you, like you might think, oh wow, 125 studies have shown some benefit. What if I told you that a million studies have been done and the rest of them showed no benefit. That changes this 125 quite a bit, doesn't it? Okay, that's the file drawer problem, and that's not specific just to, that's a bigger issue in science in general, but it's a, it's a concern. We have no way of knowing how many studies have been done that show no benefit or no effect. Um, the replication problem and the independence problem are both kind of similar. Um, one of the hallmarks of the scientific method is that if you have a good finding, other people should be able to show the same thing, right? So if I do an experiment and it works and I say it works, I should be able to take that and you should be able to take that and do that same experiment and find the same thing. Well, that doesn't always happen. When people have tried to replicate these findings, it doesn't always pan out. And that sort of prevents a confliction. There, that creates a mixed uh, evidence base there. Well, if some, one group says with method A, it works, and, the, and another group says with method A, it doesn't work, well, what does that mean, right? Um, and the other thing is the independence problem. These studies, would you be more concerned about it? Let's say, let's say I publish a paper, and I tell you that if you play Dr. Miller's game of brain training, you are going to get better, and here's a paper that shows that. I looked at 10,000 people, and all 10,000 of them got better. Oh, by the way, I work and I own the company. That changes the way you might think about that data, right? A lot of these studies have been published by the manufacturers and producers of the games themselves. Also a concern. So is it all bad? I don't think so. 
Very important point to note. Not one of these studies to date has shown that any of these training platforms are harmful. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to do, nobody has gotten worse because they've played these games. That's good. Um, if you enjoy doing them and you have the resources available to do them and you find them enjoyable, do them. There's no harm. It's not going to hurt anything. Okay? Um, but the thing I want to really caution you against, don't let it get in the way of things that we know work. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, one of the other really thing, one of my favorite sayings that uh, was by a woman who gave a, a TED talk um, not that long ago. Failure is the birthplace of innovation. Just because we haven't found what works doesn't mean that we're not going to. Okay? Failure promotes, so each time one of these things, products gets developed, each time one of these studies gets conducted and maybe it doesn't fail, that doesn't mean we don't learn anything from it. And over time, maybe we will find, and I actually kind of believe that eventually we are going to, we just not, we're just not there yet. We don't know what that is. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know how it's going to work. But I think that because the scientific community is looking at this and is invested in this and engaging with it, I think that's a really good thing. It's very likely that someday we may find what works. It's, it's like looking at like drugs and treatments for polio. I'm sure at one point in time people said, oh, none of these drugs work. Well, guess what? Found something. Just because we haven't figured it out yet doesn't mean that we won't. So if I were to develop a product and I could have free reign and make it completely ideal, first off, I would not sell it as a miracle cure. Um, I'm, I'm taking from my, my colleague here, Bart Simpson. Um, I would want these games or these platforms, these training products to be fun. I would want them to be free. I think they should be free. Uh, and I think that they would generate quick results. I think that you would experience some benefit readily from them. Uh, I think that these are things that should be available to everybody. I don't think that we would want to target and restrict access to these to a particular group of people. I think that this is something that everyone should have access to. The interesting thing, and this is one thing that gets missed a lot, I think that any training that we do should have long-term effects. But if you go to the gym, and you work out, and you get strong, you build muscles, like a bodybuilder, for example. Do you think that they just go to the gym once, they work out, they build up all that mass, and then they keep it for the rest of their life? No, you, they got to keep it up. They got to keep doing it. Brain training is the same way. Just as people come, fall in and out of physical shape, your brain may do the same thing. Um, you know, a lot of people tell me the way that uh, a lot of people come to me and they say when they go back to school as an adult, they say, oh my gosh, school is so much harder than it is now. Oh, that's just because your brain is out of shape. You know, when you're in school, you know, you went from like kindergarten all the way, if you went right through college, you know, your brain is in shape. You're in that school mode, but maybe you fall out of it a little bit. I think that this is the same way. And I think that these training products should be a way to help keep your brain in shape. Okay, so you got to keep doing it. It's not going to be the kind of thing of once and done. Um, the other thing is, is as, I going back, as I mentioned earlier about casting our net too broadly, um, I think that these, pro these platforms and these products should target specific areas of functioning. I don't think that there should be this uh, idea of like, let's target everything and see what works. It's kind of like throwing a, a net and seeing what comes back. Um, I think that that is not the right way to look about, uh, to go about developing these things. I think that really what will be helpful is if we, let's start small. If you start small, it aim small, miss small, right? I think that you can take that then and expand from there. But by us starting at the top and focusing on everything all at once, maybe we're missing some of the important things. And if we start a little bit more uh, focused, maybe that'll help us find what works. Um, and then the big thing is that I think that these should have some benefit on quality of life and overall happiness. Um, again, going back to the idea that uh, these are things that you should be able to do that have a benefit, that have some functional impact. If all you do is get better at these games, that to me is useless. Why would you want to do that, right? Um, so what are my recommendations? Uh, there's two, th two very important things that I want you to keep in mind. First and foremost, 
I, I tell this to every single patient that I see here. You want to do more today than you did yesterday. And what do I mean by that? You want to stay active. You need to stay engaged. You need to be able to do things. You need to be out and about. The, one of the worst things that you can do is turn into a couch potato and lead a sedentary life. You need to do more today, even if it's just like a minute more. One, if you did one minute, I mean, eventually you're thinking, like, I'm going to run out of minutes in the day. Well, but if you keep that attitude and the idea of pushing yourself to stay active and engaged in enjoyable, fun activities, I think that is a tremendous benefit. And there's science to show, good science, that shows that people who are active and engaged in older adulthood function better in, in late life. Okay? The other thing to know, your brain is one of the most oxygen demanding and blood demanding product organs in your whole body. If it's good for the heart, it's going to be good for the brain. Physical exercise, healthy diet, good sleep, all of these things. Again, good for the heart, good for the brain. And when we look at the science, the current state of science, I don't know if these training programs are much beyond that. Um, it's important to take a holistic approach to brain health. You can't just focus on one part of your body and forget everything else. It's just not going to work. It's not going to promote healthy aging. You need to make sure that you take a holistic approach to health and aging, particularly for brain health, because your brain is a connected part of your whole body. Um, the idea, you know, we, all, we always hear about um, the idea of use it or lose it. Well, I think there's truth in that. You want to stay active. You want to stay engaged. But if you can still do it, have you really lost it? Does that make, do you see what I'm saying? So, um, you know, you want to stay engaged. You want to stay active. And if it's something like, oh, I haven't done this in years, and here you are doing it, I guess you really haven't lost it, have you? Um, the other thing, I, I, which I realize I skipped over, is don't underestimate the power of social engagement. Being active with other people, social well-being, emotional well-being, are all things that help promote healthy aging, cognitive health, and well-being. Depression is something that we know can adversely affect cognitive functioning. And depression is something that uh, doesn't fit well with social engagement. So if you stay socially active, you can help both emotional functioning, which can also have effects on cognition as well. So don't underestimate social activity. So the question is, you're probably wondering, well, what, what about cognitive training? What's the bottom line here? My takeaway, if you like doing it, and you have the resources, and it's something that you find enjoyable, then keep it up. Probably not going to hurt anything. Is it a solution? Is it a cure? Is it going to slow aging? Is it going to prevent aging? No, I don't think so, especially with things like memory functioning. It's probably not going to have any major impact. But again, I don't see any harm in it either. Um, I don't think that the science is quite where the product developers would like us to believe that it is. Uh, I think that there's a lot of room for growth and greater scientific inquiry. Just because we haven't found it yet doesn't mean that we're not going to, and I think that we should keep looking. Because again, as I mentioned in the very beginning of our, uh, of our talk today, um, I believe that eventually that there is a, a role for this. And I think that integrating technology into clinical service is an outstanding aspiration. And to me, I am thrilled that the scientific community is looking at this because it's exciting. And I think that there is potential. We just need to figure out what that is. Um, I realize that I've uh, not left a tremendous amount of time for questions, but I, I know that this type of talk always uh, spurs uh, some interesting ideas, and I'm certainly open to, to questions if you have any. So there's a couple of things. Uh, uh, sure. So the question is, does learning a second language, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but does learning a second language uh, help brain functioning and neuroplasticity? Um, the answer isn't quite a straightforward answer, but the short answer is, I think so. Um, do I think that learning a new language is going to help prevent things like cognitive decline? 
Maybe not, but we do have pretty robust evidence that has shown that individuals who learn a second language have different language networks in the brain than people who don't speak a second language. There's, it gets very complex because there's differences in people who learned uh, a second language that were raised speaking in a bilingual home versus individuals who learned a, a second language later in life. Um, there's also differences, older adults, well, not even older adults, just adults in general who learn a second language learn more of, uh, from a memorization approach, whereas younger adults uh, and kids learn more from a process approach. They learn the rules of the language and develop, eventually develop a sense of autonomy. Those are very different brain networks responsible for that. Um, but going back to the idea of staying active and challenging yourself, learning a new language is not easy. Uh, and it's certainly something that is an engaging activity. And if you like doing it and you have a benefit from it and it's something you enjoy, I say do it. Um, you know, it's one of those things that I want to point out too. Like, you know, let's say if I were on a limited budget, which I am, uh, would, would, I div would I dedicate my resources if I, you know, to sp if I, if, let's say if I had to choose between uh, let's say uh, weekly movie tickets with my friends versus going and playing Lumosity by myself, I'm gonna go to the movies. I'm not gonna squander my money on a game like Lumosity or what, any of the other platforms. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I can comment briefly. It's a pretty broad scope. Um, but the, the question is uh, if, I, if I can comment on different learning styles, I think, and how that might influence uh, older adulthood and aging. Um, I think that the, it's, you've asked a very complex question. Because, and, the, and really, I don't think that there's a one answer uh, to that because um, you are correct that there is research that shows that learning um, can be facilitated based on individual strengths and weaknesses. Uh, for example, myself, I'm, I'm a very visual learner. Um, I, I learn uh, by seeing things in front of me, whereas some individuals uh, are much better with auditory learning and hearing and language uh, processing in that regard. Um, and that's very individualized. There's no way for us to make a generic statement. But at the core of it, the more ways that you can take in information, the more effective learning will be. Um, so like Rosetta Stone, for example, in terms of the language platform, one of their approaches is a multimodal approach. They have written on the text so you see it. They have auditory input as well. So it's, it's a multimodal uh, approach. There was a question back here. Uh huh. Product. Yes. Uh, you used it as an example on, on for peer review. Uh huh. Then you said it's a professional product. Correct. So, so, uh, so CogMed is one of the products that I'm more familiar with. It is a commercially available product, but it's not commercially available like Lumosity. So you can't go and sign up on a website without uh, working with a professional. The way that CogMed works is you would come and you'd meet with a specialist who's certified by CogMed uh, to provide that sort of intervention. You would develop, you'd go through a brief assessment, and then you'd work with that individual who's called a coach to develop a treatment program. Uh, and then that coach would work with you on a regular basis. So you would be keep going to see that professional uh, on an ongoing basis until the completion of the program. Um, so it's very, as you can see, it's very different from like Lumosity or, uh, or Brain HQ, which you do entirely on your own. This is you're constantly working in regular contact with a trained professional, which in my opinion is probably the key differentiating factor. There is peer reviewed evidence that supports CogMed's uh, benefit. Then you say perhaps it does. 
So again, the evidence is mixed. There, most of them don't have a, a, a good evidence base, but CogMed is one that there is some support showing that it does benefit. And again, that's research that's been done by somebody other than the test publisher. Somebody, it's, it's an independent uh, study. Whether or not there's been any functional real world gains, I don't know, but, uh, but there is some literature to support that it, it's benefit. Um, so the question is, do they use CogMed with people with brain disease? Um, I don't know offhand of anybody who does. Uh, I know it's not a service that we provide here at our center because neither myself nor Dr. Banks, who would be the people who would be certified, neither of us are certified uh, CogMed specialists. Where mostly CogMed gets used is with little kids, like school-aged children, people, kids with like attention deficit disorder. Um, that's where a lot of the research has been done with CogMed. Yeah, absolutely. Do any of the remote sites have any uh, questions? I see the Thank you. Yes, sir. I guess that's a no. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I always enjoy coming to give these talks, and I certainly appreciate your time and attention. I hope that you've taken. I hope that what you've taken away from this is uh, a healthy sense of skepticism, but also hope that it's not going to hurt anything. It's not all bad news.